One has now become the largest in California's history. We're also keeping an eye on politics today. Sanctions against Iran went into effect overnight. We're hearing from the president this morning on that, as well as a big day in politics. Primary races in several states. We're going to have the latest on all of that for you. But first, here are your day's top headlines. Voters at the polls in primaries today in several states and a special election in Ohio in a race to fill a seat that's been in Republican hands for more than three decades. One of the most violent weekends the Windy City has seen this year. At least 14 dead, more than 50 injured by gun violence, and so far, zero arrests. One trauma center so overwhelmed, a family members forced to wait outside. The reward for information in the disappearance of Iowa jogger Molly Tibbetts continues to grow, now close to $280,000. Her father, Rob Tibbetts, spoke to ABC News. It's totally speculation. It's not based on any fact or any data or any information we've heard from the authorities. <clears throat> but I do believe that Molly is with someone who she knows. Molly vanished about three weeks ago. Right-wing InfoWars host Alex Jones has been removed from nearly all social media platforms. Facebook shut down several of Jones's pages for violating standards against hate speech that attacks or dehumanizes others. Over the past several days, Apple, YouTube, and Spotify have also removed material published by Jones. Terrifying moments caught on dash cam video. Watch as a car collides with a crashed vehicle on the side of a Toronto highway. Debris flying onto the flatbed of the tow truck. Global News reported two people were taken to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries and a third person sustained minor injuries. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket successfully launched from Cape Canaveral overnight. The purpose of the mission? To carry a communication satellite into orbit. This is the first time SpaceX has reused one of their powerful boosters, all part of SpaceX's plan to reuse rockets and boosters to cut costs. And we're going to start things off with politics this morning. The first set of U.S. sanctions against Iran went into effect overnight. Now, these were sanctions originally lifted with the Iran nuclear deal, but the president, you might remember, backed out of that deal earlier this year. And this morning, he has a warning for anyone wanting to do business with Iran. Tara Palmieri is in Ben Bister, New Jersey, where the president is on vacation. And Tara, he's clearly not taking a vacation from Twitter. No, definitely not. And these Iran, these Iran sanctions certainly ratchet up pressure on that country, but they also worsen relationships with our European allies who we've already had a lot of disagreements with over trade, how to deal with NATO spending, and also Russian relations. So, you know, international... Um, in, uh, international inspectors say that Iran is complying with the deal, and now with the sanctions back in place, any country that does business with Iran would face penalties from the United States. Uh, U.S. officials tell us, though, that 100 companies have already pulled out of Iran, and now European companies and Chinese and Russian that are all a part of the Iran nuclear deal, uh, they have to decide whether it's worth it to do business with the U.S. or a smaller market, Iran. And Tara, what's the White House Diane? stance on this? Because we heard the president wrote, wrote on Twitter that he's looking to establish world peace. Right. There are two possibilities. Iran will start breaking down its nuclear reactors and its uh, plutonium enrichment, but the other is that they will actually build it up to become more of a threat. Uh, it's probably likely another 10 years before there's another leader, and the U.S. claims that they don't want regime change. That's not the purpose of these sanctions. So it's unclear what will happen next. Will they increase their capabilities or they won't? And will the U.S. turn, to, turn a blind eye? Um, to business relationships that our allies have with Iran, it's, you know, sanctions are really only as much as you want to enforce them. And, and we've seen even with, in the past with Cuba, the U.S. often turned a blind eye to companies that were doing uh, business with, uh, to countries who had companies that were doing business with Cuba. All right. Seems like, in, like in so many other cases, seems like we're in a game of wait and see with that one. But Tara, it's also a big right. day mm -hmm. in politics. I know there are primary races in several states, also a special House election going on in Ohio. So how are things looking on that front? 
Well, President Trump gave an 11th hour endorsement to Chris Kobach of Kansas in the primary over there. He's this could be a boost for him, actually. But Democrats also see it as a possible boon that it might actually help with fundraising uh, for progressives who really want to make sure that we don't get an, they don't get another Trump supported candidate. Let's not forget that while President Trump won Kansas by 20 points, former Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius of the Obama administration, she was the Democratic governor of Kansas, so it can really go either way. Um, and then we have Ohio, which all eyes are on Ohio. President Trump was just there this weekend. Two candidates, a Democrat and a Republican, and the Republican is neck and neck with the Democrat in a district that President Trump won by 11 points, although it seems that that candidate has gotten a few point bump since President Trump came to town um, and started campaigning for him. But even if he only wins by a few points, it's a sign of trouble for the Republicans. All right. And so Diane? many things left to be decided by Congress after these elections. Tara, so many people watching to see how mm. this all plays out. That's Tara Palmieri for us in Bedminster, New Jersey. Thanks, Tara. And now we're going to move on to that fraud trial against President Trump's former campaign chair, Paul Manafort. The prosecution star witness, Manafort's former deputy, took the stand yesterday with some fairly explosive testimony and even an admission on his part. Catherine Falders is following all of that for us from Alexandria, Virginia. And Catherine, quite a first day on the stand from this guy. A quite a first day, an explosive first day. Uh, Gates said yesterday that he spent years committing crimes uh, with Manafort at Manafort's direction. And this included not reporting uh, more than a dozen of those offshore accounts. You know, prosecutors um, allege that Manafort, uh, Manafort failed to report tens of millions in his offshore accounts. They also say he falsified his tax returns. So quite an explosive day, Diane, that first day on the sand. You know that these two men have spent years uh, working together. Uh, Rick Gates was a former deputy campaign manager on President uh, Trump's campaign. He's been cooperating with the special counsel uh, for five months now. He revealed yesterday that he's met with Mueller's team about 20 times. So a little color inside that courtroom yesterday. It was very cold. Uh, Manafort stared him down essentially the whole time. He was very stiff, not taking notes like he usually does. And Gates uh, largely avoided eye contact with him. But the main headline out of that yesterday was that he admitted to committing crimes with Paul Manafort at Manafort's direction, Diane. All right. So it was a big day for the prosecution. But of course, he was under questioning by the prosecution. Today, he faces cross-examination by the defense. What will they be looking to show? That's right. So he is the, the court. I actually just got word that they're in recess until 1120. They have a few more. The prosecution has a few more hours of questioning uh, today. But the defense is likely to question his credibility in their cross-examination. An important point here is that the defense has really made this case all about Rick Gates. He was the reason uh, why uh, these alleged crimes uh, were committed uh, by Manafort. He was really the man running the operation. But this is an important point, is that Manafort's attorneys will well, certainly view they certainly view what the prosecution say is the starred witness. They view Gates as a flawed candidate. So yesterday, Gates, who was allegedly helping Manafort commit these crimes of bank fraud and tax evasion, well, Gates testified under oath that he didn't benefit from those crimes at all. But here's the catch. Separately, uh, Gates said under oath that he embezzled several hundred thousand dollars from Manafort, transferring that money from Manafort's accounts in Cyprus to Gates's accounts in the UK. And that's important because the defense will surely make the point that, in fact, Gates was benefiting from this and benefiting from his work with Manafort. All right. Sounds like they're both trying desperately to point the finger at the other direction. We will see how he does under cross-examination today. That's Catherine Faldus for us in Alexandria, Virginia. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, now let's move over to the West Coast where those wildfires are burning out of control. Hot temperatures, the hottest of the season, in fact, are making that much more difficult to fight. And now the Mendocino Complex fire is the largest in California's history. Will's car is uh, in Trabuco Canyon for us, keeping track of all of it. Will? Good morning, Diane. Fire crews continuing to encounter intense conditions on the ground. Overnight, we saw a hellish orange glow on the skyline, a constant reminder that this is another record setting fire season and there is still a long way to go. The Mendocino complex fire has continued to explode. It's now the largest wildfire in California's history. More than 283,000 acres have burned so far. That's nearly 450 square miles. The fire 30% contained. 
This morning, 9,300 structures are threatened. 75 homes have already burned to the ground. There are now 18 large wildfires burning across the state with 14,000 firefighters on the ground. The car fires entering its third week and it has left a trail of destruction, burning more than 1,000 homes and 163,000 acres. Two firefighters were injured in the Holy Fire here in Southern California that erupted Monday in Orange County. That fire is continuing to spread quickly. 4,000 acres burned so far, and it's 0% contained. We also have amazing video of two hikers being rescued after they were trapped by the blaze. The elderly couple scrambled into a canyon where they were rescued and pulled to safety by a helicopter. And Yosemite National Park is now closed indefinitely. The Ferguson fire smoked just too much for tourists. That fire are now the fourth largest in the state's history. These are basically perfect fire conditions. Last year, the Thomas fire became the largest fire in California's history. That started burning in December. As I mentioned, the Mendocino complex has now surpassed that fire in size. And Diane, we're only in August. Yeah, I know this is just the beginning of that heat, Will. Those firefighters have a lot of work to hell. That was Will Carr for us out in California. Thanks, Will. Meanwhile, in Colorado, it's not the heat, but it's hail that they're dealing with a dangerous hail storm. They have injured dozens of people and caused some serious damage. Clayton Sandell is in Colorado Springs for us, hopefully taking cover, Clayton. Hey, Diane, we are here in the parking lot of the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo here in Colorado Springs. And if you're not familiar with this area, this zoo is actually built on the side of a mountain here and they can get some pretty severe weather pushing through here. And that is exactly as you can see what happened yesterday evening. Uh, this whole parking lot here is filled this morning with cars that uh, have been damaged in a, in a severe hailstorm here. You can see, I mean, we've got back windows busted out, uh, sunroof on that car completely uh, smashed in. Uh, there are pieces of cars all over the ground, smashed, uh, shattered glass. Uh, they estimate that anywhere from 300, maybe 400 cars were uh, were destroyed here yesterday when this hailstorm hit the zoo. Uh, there were about 3,400 people here at the time. Uh, parents, families, kids uh, attending camp. Um, there were some injuries. There were 14 people who were injured uh, in the hailstorm, and five of those injuries were serious enough that they had to be carted off uh, to a hospital. So it's a pretty severe incident, and uh, we saw all kinds of video posted online uh, overnight, social media of uh, hail coming down. There were some shots of some grizzly bears in their enclosure, and the hail is just coming down like, like almost like bullets into the water, and they're trying to find shelter. So there were scenes like that. Uh, the zoo says that they did lose a few birds um, and they are checking to see if other animals are injured. I think they're still probably doing that tally here this morning. But, uh, you know, as we walk along here, this is just a row of eight cars uh, and every single one of them has a back window or front window uh, smashed out. Uh, so a lot of people contemplating uh, calls to the insurance companies this morning. And take a look at the ground here. You know, sometimes in a hailstorm, you can get a little bit of cover from the trees above, but in this case, uh, they were not much uh, help. Uh, the hail came in this direction, it looks like, and here's, uh, you, you can see even the front windshields. I mean, some of these dents are just incredible. Look at that. And this one right up here, just hit that so hard and, and inside, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's glass all over the dashboard. Uh, of this car. So some really severe damage. We're told that the uh, hailstones that were falling were anywhere from like tennis ball sized to uh, softball sized, which is huge uh, when it's coming out of the sky. Uh, so this morning they have decided to close the zoo. If you look down the street here, uh, you can see the uh, Colorado Springs police have this area blocked off. The only people they're letting in this morning are zoo employees to come in and take care of the animals. Uh, and every few minutes, we are seeing a lot of tow trucks. They have to come in and, uh, and get all of these uh, cars out of here before they can reopen the zoo. Uh, so that's what's happening here. The only uh, other thing that is happening here today is that we are expecting some more severe weather later this afternoon into the evening. So we'll see how it goes. Diane. Just what they needed. More severe weather in Colorado Springs. Clayton, thanks for that report. Now it's time to check in with Ginger Z, who unfortunately does not have good news for us if you were looking for a break from the heat. Ginger. 
Diane, thank you. Let's go ahead and start with those wildfires. Now the largest in California state history. That's the Mendocino Fire. 283,000 plus acres burned, 30% contained. Those numbers, unfortunately, going to go up, as will the Holy Fire. That is no containment. More than 4,000 acres in Southern California. That from those sundowner winds. So it doesn't matter exactly where you are on the West Coast, but it's a hot, dry, unstable air mass for a lot of folks. And that's why you see red flag warnings popping, still excessive heat warnings in the desert southwest. And that heat is going to back up that high is going to back up and cause places like Seattle to get even hotter. Look at Bakersfield staying at 106 both Wednesday and Thursday. So horrible conditions there. The Pacific looking really active. Uh, four areas of tropical waves. Uh, Hector is the one that everybody has their eyes on because it'll go close to Hawaii. It's very compact. We call it annular, uh, meaning it's sym symmetrical. That's a good thing because the more compact it stays, the farther it will be from Hawaii as it slides west and northwest. It's really on Wednesday that we'll see the impact. Some of the swells could reach 12 to even 18 feet, but we're watching that one closely. As were the sky, we were watching the skies closely in Nebraska as that shelf cloud, that's a time lapse of a shelf cloud rolling across the land there. This cold front pushing through now going to move potential for flash flooding and also just a lot of rain, even if it doesn't cause flash flooding. Some areas will pick up more than three inches if you're in northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, even northwest Georgia. So that's a look at everything happening on the maps for now. We'll go back to Diane. All right, Ginger, thanks. From the skies to the water now, over in Florida, a red tide is creating toxic fumes over more than 100 miles of coastline. Victor Okendo is on Santa Ban Island. And, Victor, is this a Mother Nature thing, a man-made thing, or a little bit of both? It's a combination, Diane, and we're here on a beach, and when you come out to one of these beaches in this area, the first thing that hits you is the smell. It's powerful, and there is no avoiding it. And then you walk over to where the tide is starting to come in, right along the shoreline, and take a look. You just got a ton of like little dead fish here. Crews have been out here trying to clean these up. It's such a sad situation, and they keep washing ashore. And it's not just here on the beaches along the coastline. We actually spent some time out on the water yesterday on a boat, and you'll see fish of all sizes, little bait fish that fishermen will use to big 100 plus pound tarpon and cobia, stuff like that, just floating on the surface of the water. So there's two things at play here. First, you've got the red tide, and take a look right out there onto the water. It looks kind of reddish, kind of uh, like a rust color. Now the red tide is an annual, naturally occurring event. This one, however, has lasted much longer than normal red tide. This one has lasted uh, since last October. Now, what we've also got at play here is nutrient-rich water coming from Lake Okeechobee in central Florida that's filled with blue-green algae. Now, that is caused from runoff from large farms and businesses. So that part, uh, certainly a man-made aspect there. Now, that nutrient-rich blue-green algae-filled water makes its way down from central Florida uh, through rivers and stuff like that uh, into the Gulf Coast. Now, that blue-green algae actually dies in the salt water, but it ends up feeding the red tide, compounding the problem, kind of creating what it's like a, a one-two punch out here. So it's extremely deadly to marine life, as we've been able to see. Thousands of dead fish, dead turtles, manatees, even a huge whale shark killed by this red tide. And for humans, it's also really harmful. This beach, for example, we're the only ones out here right now. Uh, eventually, you spend enough time out here, your throat starts to burn a little bit, your eyes will water. I mentioned the smell earlier. It is awful. And if you actually ingest any of this water, that's really harmful too. So it's a very, very tough situation right now for everybody who has to live through this. Uh, and they have been for almost nine months now, Diane. And Victor, what causes that red color? Is it just a different kind of algae? So that's, it's just, it's the red tide algae bloom. That's exactly what causes it. And right now there's, there's no real end in sight. One expert told us that it could last, you know, until the end of the rainy season, which here in Florida would be right around the end of October, but it could last much longer than that. So is there a way to either contain this or prevent it from happening again? So there's something that can be done to kind of prevent that blue-green algae from spreading this far and, and becoming that bad of a situation. The key there is to stop the runoff from those farms and businesses in central Florida because it's that water going down those rivers and that ends up feeding this and making this problem so much worse. So containment really is the key. But right now, as you're seeing, uh, the situation here is awful. All right, Victor. Well, I know it smells terrible out there. It's probably not great for you to be out there. So. We're going to get you back inside. We appreciate it, though, you monitoring this for us and checking in with us. Thanks, Vic. 
And finally, we want to end today with two hero police officers who are telling their story this morning after pulling a man from a burning car. The whole thing was captured on body cam. Steve Osinsami is in Atlanta. And Steve, looking at this video, it's incredible what they did. It is, especially when you look at it through the environment that we're in. You know, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of eyeballs on police officers across the country, body cameras capturing their actions because of the environment that we're in. And this is a reason to celebrate police officers across the country. Two young officers uh, were responding to a call of a car on fire. You see one of the officers, Charles Tierney, who's just 27 years old and hasn't even graduated from the police academy. He's holding a fire extinguisher and approaching the car, trying to put out the flames, and he's having trouble doing that. On the other side of the car, and I don't know if you can see that quite yet in the video, there is a second officer. Her name is Brittany Williams. She is 25 years old. She's in the back seat of the car trying to get the victim who's still stuck in the car, a car that's on fire, from the front seat into the back and out the back door. But she can't move him because he has broken bones and one of his legs is stuck underneath the dashboard. She tells us that she talks to him, tells him to give it everything he can, and then you see them pull him out of the car. All of the officers drag this man out of the car and essentially save his life. There were three people who walked away from this scene. Police officers, these officers are being celebrated this morning in Atlanta by not just the police off the police department, but also by this community. Very, Diane. very well deserved. It sounds like Stephen. I know that bystanders got some other people out of that car, but they decided that person in the front seat, it was just too dangerous. And here come these two officers and decide, nope, we're going to go in and put our life on the line to do this. How are they reacting to this now that they're getting so much attention? So the officers uh, are, of course, floored by all of this because it happened so quickly. So this accident happened at the end of their shift on Sunday night morning. So about 4 a.m. Sunday morning. Uh, by Sunday afternoon, this video was everywhere. We talked with those two officers, and we have a little bit of that to share with you right now. It was teamwork. It wasn't a single person's effort. We literally, like, give each other a hug. <laughs> At yeah. the end of it, because we were just so overwhelmed. Like, when we finished, we just hugged each other. It's definitely uh, part of what we signed up for, I think. Um, and the pride that we got of just helping another person and helping uh, save his life. The three people who were taken from that scene are still hospitalized today. Uh, the young man in the front was 26 years old. He also is in, uh, we're told, in stable condition. Uh, but again, these officers saved the life because of their quick action. And, you know, one thing I should also point out, the officer who pulled the young man from the front seat into the back, she was half the size of the guy who she was pulling out of that car. Diane. It's incredible what we are capable of in times like that. And uh, well deserved, all these celebrations for these officers, as well as those bystanders that jumped in and saved those other passengers in the vehicle. Uh, Steve, they deserve all the credit in the world. Uh, and thank you. You deserve it as well for that great report. We appreciate it. Thanks. And that does it for us today on ABC News Live. Don't forget that you can stay up to date on the latest news and videos at abcnews.com, as well as the ABC News app. For ABC News Live, I'm Diane Macedo. Have a great day, everyone.